This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror sci-fi show where things could get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming Mimi Gibson. Mimi is a um, former child actress from the 50s and 60s. Uh, she was in a lot of great movies. Um, the Ten Commandments, um, The Monster That Challenged the World, The Three Faces of Eve, Houseboat with Cary Grant and Sophia Loren. She was on so many different shows, Playhouse 90, uh, The Rebel with Nick Adams, Leave it to Beaver. She did the voice of Lucky in the Disney cartoon classic 101 Dalmatians. She, she did a lot of great stuff. And um, lately, she's been um, an advocate um, for um, child actor protection laws, um, a minor consideration, which uh, she does with Paul Peterson. Um, who she worked with in Houseboat, and um, we're going to talk about all of that stuff today. She also uh, has a memoir out called Working Kid, a memoir of a child actor of the 50s and 60s, the 1950s and 1960s, I should say, and uh, she's going to be at the Hollywood Show in Burbank April 15th and 16th, and it's going to be a great conversation today. I love talking to actors from the golden age of Hollywood, you know, that amazing time, of amazing creativity in film, which is lacking today. And I am so honored that we're going to talk today during March Madness. So, uh, yeah, here is my interview with Mimi Gibson. Hello. Hey, Mimi, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm great. How are you? I am just spectacular. This is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, thank you for having me. My pleasure. So, going back in time, uh, you were obviously a child actress. At what age did acting start for you? Two and a half. Two and a half. Yeah, I was coloring on a floor... Uh, in my coloring book, not on, on the floor, but uh, mm. at a singing teacher's studio, and Hazel McMillan, who was an agent, but she also had a daughter who was um, the niece on Our Miss Brooks, and she was taking singing lessons, and I was waiting with my mom for my sister who was having a singing lesson. And Hazel saw me and said to my mom, want to get her in the movies? And what do you think my <laughs> mom said? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how it started. Wow, so, so you earned it. Your parents weren't in the business. No. My dad had died recently. And uh -huh. um, we had lived on Whidbey Island in Washington. And my mom was a California girl, and Daddy died, and she went back to Los Angeles, where she had loved the weather. And it was too rainy up in Washington. Oh, yeah. Uh, my dad lives up in Washington in Marysville, and it rains a lot over there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is um, is Mimi your birth name or was that a nickname? Uh, I couldn't say I couldn't say my name, mm -hmm. so uh, it came out as Mimi. <laughs> okay, because <laughs> I because I because I know a Maria and she goes by Mimi. <laughs> yeah, a lot of M names are Mimi now. Um, I was Merrily, which is a pretty name, mm -hmm. but I couldn't say it, and so uh, it just. And I still go by it now, even though my legal name is Marilee. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty name, though. Yeah. So you, yeah, the, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the first movie was Corky of Gasoline Alley with Mickey Rooney and Eddie Bracken? Yep, and I got that movie uh, two days after uh, Hazel saw me. Yeah, uh, Edward Burns, who directed a lot of the Three Stooges shorts, directed it. Um, I'm sure you don't remember much about it, though, being that you were two and a half. Well, I do remember doing it a little bit mm -hmm. because, you know, I had, although I 
started out as a calendar girl. Mm. Um, and this is before the movie. Uh, when I was very, very little, maybe not even two, um, Mom took me around to different photographers. Mm -hmm. And um, I was a pretty little girl, and I liked any animal I saw. Any oh. to me, I'd like it. And a lot of kids are afraid, you know, they're pretty or they're handsome little boys, but some of them don't like animals all that much when they're little. But I absolutely adored everything. And so I was the number one calendar girl in the United States for six years. And um, I worked, those were the days when businesses gave out calendars at Christmas time or right. gave them out at Easter time or whatever. And it was always kids and animals. And that was what it was. There were other calendars, but I'm not talking about those kind. <laughs> I'm <laughs> talking about the family ones. And yeah. so uh, they were very, very popular in the early 50s. And um, I did a lot of calendars. A lot of them. And I still have a lot of copies of those photos to this day. And they're really quite dear. They're sweet little things. And so I started working with other kids, too, on the calendars and then kind of moved over to the movies. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those kids did also. So we kind of all knew each other, and it was nice. Yeah, so you were a kid model. Yes, I was. Nice. Yeah, because that, that was, that was just, like, television was brand new at that time, so you couldn't have started out in commercials like a lot of child actors did after you. Correct. That's right. So, you know, I did billboards. I did uh, advertisements in magazines mm -hmm. and things like that. I also did a lot of work for Loma Linda, uh, the Seventh Day Adventist. I really liked them. They send me a case of food. <laughs> 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 they have their own, you know, they're vegetarian, and I think they're the healthiest people on the planet. Yeah. And uh, they would send me cans of their veggie patties and um, their wheat a biscuits and all of that, and I loved them. They were, that was great. I thought it was like Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You were in uh, The Egyptian with Victor Mature and uh, Jane Simmons. Do you remember anything about that? Absolutely. So uh, I'll tell you my one really funny story about The Egyptian. Okay. So, you know, if I don't know if, if you've seen any of the shots from that movie, but we... Long time ago. Three of us little princesses. Yeah. And we were all in these gorgeous linen dresses with red belts that hung down and had jewels encrusted on them and gold. It was quite stunning. We were all just thrilled. And they had asked me when I went on the interview, do you like animals? And I said, yes. And they said, how about a monkey? And I said, yes. And they said, oh, okay, good. So uh, the uh, trainer of the monkey came up to me with the monkey and said, here, here's the monkey. Don't move your hand too fast or it'll bite you. <laughs> <laughs> and I was about five. And it's like, what? And so <laughs> here I'm holding on to this thing. And I'm thinking, shoot, you know? Yeah. I I don't know, <laughs> I better not scratch my face or anything, And uh, but everything went off without a hitch, and we did this scene where we're all walking in to see the pharaoh, our father, and um, it was fine, and so the trainer comes and gets the monkey, and the monkey had pooped. Oh. Down the <laughs> and I just, you know, I was horrified this was such a gorgeous dress, mm -hmm. and he just got out his knife and scraped it off, and <laughs> that was that, and nobody ever said anything or did anything, and that was it. 
<laughs> oh my God! It must have been stinky in there. <laughs> uh, it was. It was. Well, you know, I gave it to the wardrobe lady, and she got it cleaned. But oh man, that was just that was crazy. It was really <laughs> crazy. And Victor Mature was so kind and sweet and. Uh, he loved me. He loved all the little girls. He was just an adorable man. And yeah. let's see, I was it. Who else was in that? Was it Luana Patton? Who? I can't remember. Well, it was it was it was Gene Simmons, Gene Tierney, and um, who else? I'm trying to remember. I don't know. There was another young woman. And she and Victor Mature and we would, you know, hang out in one of their dressing rooms and just, he just talked to us. He was just a nice man. He wasn't creepy or anything. He was just really a, a darling man. And he always played these kind of rough roles and he-man roles. But he was just really nice. Yeah, I'm uh, Facebook friends with his daughter. She'll be very pleased to hear that. Oh, tell her. He was a doll, and I have photos that I just love looking at of us together. Oh, absolutely. Do you remember anything about Michael Curtiz? I remember him just a little bit. Uh-huh. I don't remember him a lot. I don't remember directors all that much because, <coughs> excuse me. Yes. I have allergies, and it's been windy today. Oh, we all we all have those. <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyway, um, you'll remember much about Michael I, Curtiz. I, I, he was a nice man, and I think he gave me some gifts. <laughs> gave you gifts. I'm so sorry. It's okay. And um, but I don't. I think he was older, a lot older. Yeah. And that's about all I remember. As uh, Easter is on the horizon, you were in the Ten Commandments. That must have been a huge career highlight for you. Well, it was like having the circus in your studio that you're working at. It was fabulous. It was it was so much fun for kids. Oh, they, they told us to stay away from the animals, but we all got as close as we could get. There were camels and tigers and this and that, and it was all on the Paramount set, and it was, oh, my gosh. It was just the most fun any set could ever be. And... Um, so I, I had a great time on that movie, except Bobby Clark and I got in trouble for playing doctor. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and if anybody knows where Bobby Clark is, I, I would sure like to see him again. I have not seen him for decades and decades, and we worked together a lot. He was a very sweet little boy. Yeah, well, where you two were showing each other your belly buttons or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was so much more innocent back then. Nowadays, you'd probably be be, be fired for that. <laughs> <laughs> probably, I, I. It was just our moms that caught us, and that was you know bad enough. Uh, but you know, those it was uh, very innocent. It wasn't anything. You know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what, what what was Charlton Heston like? Oh, well, the joke on the set was he took a step down to play Moses because he thought he was God. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard he was pretty full of himself, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I never interacted with him. I didn't have any scenes with him. You know, I was just the kid with her grandfather and brother, but we were all on uh, the set with the parting of the Red Sea, and Cecil B. DeMille, of course, was on a camera, 
way high above us on a dolly. It was quite spectacular. And you couldn't see the, the, it was just a green screen behind us, so we couldn't see anything. And, um, and he, he did have a megaphone, and he did shout at people, and we all heard how if you were not doing the right thing, he'd yell at you in front of everybody. Mm-hmm. And so all of us, especially the kids, we tried to do our best. And he shouted to me, he called my name, mm-hmm. and he said, good job. And that meant the world to me. You know, he was, I knew how important he was. And uh, that was, that was wonderful. Yeah. And it was fun. And the prop men threw pieces of chariots at us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that was one of Yul Brenner's first movies. And um, uh, Edward G. Robinson was coming off of being blacklisted. Um, he, he actually is quoted as to saying, that Cecil B. DeMille uh, restored his self-respect, you know, because he had been doing B-movies for a few years until this one. Well, I didn't ask with him, but I met him um, in the Valley at a shopping center in Sherman Oaks. and They had... uh, a piano in one of the side rooms where you could have receptions, and he would go in there and play the piano. And mm-hmm. he was just a kind, charming man. He was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, did you work with Eugene Mazzola? I certainly did. We did a movie called, it was a religious movie. Uh-huh. Uh huh. And some of the kids at school said they saw it as they came back from, you know, hmm. like on a Monday, and they said they saw the movie at, at Sunday school. It was called 14 Going on 16. <laughs> and it was about a girl, me, who lied about her age so she could go out on a date with this boy who was Eugene. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's like a big producer now or something. Oh, is he? I have no idea. You know, I've not had... I wrote my book, of course, Working yeah. Kids. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but I've had nothing to do with the business except to go back in the Screen Actors Guild in, in 93. And a bunch of us, Paul Peterson and Jeannie Russell and Johnny Whitaker... Uh, we all worked to change the Pugin law, and we got it done. And it took us, it took us years, eight years almost. Mm-hmm. Which I'm going to, okay. yes, which I'm going to ask you uh, more about in a little bit, but. Uh, okay, sorry I got it. <laughs> it's okay, it's okay. Um, so yeah, like, uh. Did, did you get did 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 um did Cecil B. DeMille look like he knew this was going to be the last movie he directed? Uh, absolutely not. He looked. Uh, he marched around. He was. He looked to me, and I was just this little kid. But he looked fine to me. He didn't look infirm or anything. And maybe he was. But you know how people they kind of man up to do things, and he was. He was up there on that, uh, you know, uh, many feet above us, um, shouting orders and directing. So he, he was up to the part, let me tell you. He, he looked okay. Right, and then you did the, um, the Buccaneer, which he produced, and uh, Anthony Quinn directed that. What was he like? Anthony Quinn was the most wonderful man. He he was larger than life and he was joyful. And I've never met anyone quite like him. He was a pleasure to work with. But Jerry Hartleton and I shared most of our scenes together. Mm-hmm. And Jerry was a 
sweet boy also, N- real nice young man. And, and and Anthony, if you know, we did a, a take fairly quickly, he'd grab us both and he'd kiss us. <laughs> and Terry would turn bright red. <laughs> grabbed by a guy and kiss. And it was hilarious. And um, I just enjoyed that that uh, shoot so very much. It was fun. And I got to play a brat, which playing a brat is always, you know, fun yeah. to play. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I did a tribute to Anthony Quinn last year because it was the 20th anniversary of his death, and I talked to his widow, Kathy, and she's keeping his, his legacy alive with the Anthony Quinn Foundation. Oh, good for her. Good for her. I'll have to look into that. He was just, he was wonderful. Wow. Yeah, and a workaholic, too. It's amazing how he was able to do that many movies, and also he had like 13 kids, but he was a, they, he was a good father, though. I bet. I, I bet he had 13 kids. He was just too charismatic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Then then you were in a uh, Creature Features classic, The Monster That Challenged the World. Oh, that was, that was fun, too. Because I was still a kid, but I wasn't a little, little kid. Mm-hmm. And people brought me and let me follow them around. So I got to watch them operate the monster, which were one guy on a bicycle pump on one side and one guy with a bicycle pump on the other side. (laughs) It was really quite (laughs) low budget. And, um, but it was, and the eyes were light bulbs that they put debris and water into. And um, and then it had this slime, and so they taught me how to make the slime. So my mom uh, let me go with her to the market and pick out this. It was gosh, it was ivory snowflakes or some kind of flaky detergent, and then you had to put water with it and get it a certain consist slimy consistency. Yeah. And then after I made it. You know, she wouldn't let me put it on anything. <laughs> I was stuck with a bucket of slime. <laughs> <laughs> and the monster didn't have the ability to grasp anything. So you had to, you know, kind of, they took a lot of um, stills with me in its arms. But I had to hold the arms around me. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's still a popular movie. I'm going to go to Phoenix, well, actually, Candler this coming October, and we're going to have it for Halloween um, there uh-huh. in Arizona. And that's going to be fun. People really like that movie. And it's gone from being slightly scary to being hilarious. So now it's really yeah. fun to go watch. <laughs> yeah, in San Francisco, where I'm from, uh, there's a creature feature show, and they always get, you know, the star of a creature features movie to come in and, uh, you know, and hang out and do an interview, you know, on camera between, you know, commercials and the movie and stuff. I'm surprised they haven't reached out to you for this yet. Well, I'm kind of obscure, so, you know, but I'm getting out there because, you know, I I wrote my book. And yeah. Will not talk about that, but but that's why I'm out there more. I'm I, even though I'm friendly and outgoing, I'm a very private person, mm-hmm. and so I've not been out and around, and I haven't acted in fifty years, so that's a long time. Right. Then you played the uh, eight-year-old Eve in The Three Faces of Eve. I love this movie. I think it was probably the first movie that explored mental illness and schizophrenia in its history. I think you're right. I think you're right. And and everybody knew it was an important movie. And when I was interviewed, uh, they said, you know, this is what you're going to have to do. 
And I said, I'll do it, but I don't want anybody in the casket. That'll give me nightmares. <laughs> and they asked me. And I thought that was very good of them. You know, it's not like they just flung it on me. And um, so they said, okay, you don't have to have anybody in the casket. And after I did all the screaming and everything, I, I forget who the director was on that, but uh, he gave me 50 cents for cough drops. <laughs> <laughs> yeah oh that's awesome yeah yeah, yeah, so, yeah did you meet joanne woodward well i have a bill that is on i think it's on my imdb i don't have it have it but it's on there and it's me and joanne woodward and somebody else i don't know who uh -huh. a guy and we're looking at something together. So I guess we were doing publicity photos, but I don't remember one bit of it. But the interesting thing was the next movie I did was No Down Payment, mm -hmm. and I worked with her on that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I didn't get to see her. I didn't work with her because I was playing her. Yeah. And um, But I got to work with the great Nancy Culp, and she was always just a terrific actress. I loved her. She was just fabulous. She played my mom in Three Faces of Beef. Um, yeah. But, uh, but, so there were, you no know, payment was about families and kids that were, you know, moving into this housing development. And so, you know, I got to talk to her just a little bit. Uh, she didn't play my mom. And uh, so, you know, that was fine. That was good. Yeah. Now we get to um, houseboats. What, that was a huge staple of my childhood. Um, we had a UHF station in the Bay Area, KBHK 44, and they would show all the Paramount movies because Paramount eventually bought them and they were UPN for a few years. And I used to see Houseboat on all the time. Um, what was it like uh, working with Cary Grant? He was wonderful. Everybody in the cast and crew and director and producer Mel Shabelson and Jack Rose, they were, everybody was wonderful. It was a wonderful shoot. We had a wonderful time. It, we got to spend a month in Washington, D.C. We had a, our own chauffeur-driven limousine that took us to see everything there was to see there. Mm -hmm. And Cary Grant was very nice and and he lectured us a little bit. He liked to lecture children, which, you know, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he told me not to feed my husband fattening food and things like that. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so that, and Sophia was, you know, she was the up-and-coming star, and she was... Sweet and funny and uh, lovely, just a, a lovely woman. And everybody else was great, and it was great. And I, you know, I knew both of the the boys from before. I'd worked with Charlie on like four other movies, and I worked with Paul for the first time. We did a TWA ad when I was three and he was five. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. I met Paul in 1990 when I was six years old. My mom and I were at the, the, the shopping mall, and um, the, the Nick at Night stars uh, were there signing autographs. That used, They used to do that a lot back then. And Paul was there. We went over to his table. He was very nice to us, and we got his autograph. And uh, unfortunately, we lost them. They'd be worth a lot today. Oh, darn. Yeah, really? Yeah. Well, Paul is... He's not well, but he's still hanging in there. Yeah. I talk to him monthly. You know, we are still in touch. And he's the one who got us all back into the union. So he's, and Paul's done a lot of good things in his adult life. He's really to be congratulated. Absolutely. And I love him very, very much. And we're both very, very sorry that Charlie has passed on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> wasn't there wasn't there a scene where 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 Cary Grant like uh, pinched Sophia Loren's ass? <laughs> no, 
No, it's Murray Hamilton. Oh, okay. That, and it's shocking nowadays. You never see that nowadays. Yeah. You know, there are some scenes in that movie that, uh-uh, not now. You couldn't get away with it. And it was Murray Hamilton, yeah. Oh, boy. <laughs> Were, were you under Were you under contract at Paramount? I was never under contract. I was always a freelance artist. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Barney Balabin was running Paramount at that time, and a journalist asked him, uh, "What's it like running Paramount?" And he said, "Well, if Jerry Lewis wants to burn down the studio, I'll give him a match." <laughs> <laughs> Did you did you did you ever see Jerry Lewis around Paramount? I actually did. Uh -huh. Walking with the uh, hair and makeup used to take me with them if they had to go to another set. And I was a good kid. I got along with everybody. And um, somebody had asked me, and I can't remember who it was, if I wanted to to go meet somebody and I said sure and I went with them and on the way we encountered Jerry Lewis walking with three or four other people and you know he was always so zany and when you're a kid mm -hmm. you think that people are going to act like they act in the movies and <laughs> we came up to him and he was smoking a pipe and wearing a tennis sweater <laughs> <laughs> To me, that was very unlike what I expected to see him, and um, and so he talked to me, and he was very serious and didn't pay much attention to me, you know, said a few things, and then we moved on, and and he was very very serious, not the least bit funny, yeah. not really very friendly either, uh, and that was my Jerry Lewis experience. I'm not surprised. Yeah, I heard he could not be uh, that friendly um, at times. Yeah. You did uh, some episodes of Playhouse 90. Uh, were you comfortable performing in front of a live audience? Oh, my God. I think that was the highlight of my career. Doing live TV, I love doing... We did Jack Benny, we did Red Skelton, and to top it off, we did... We, uh, we did Climax, and then there was another live one, I think it was called Into the Air or something like that. And then there was the star of everything, Playhouse 90. And why they don't do that today, I'll never know. I mean, that, mu that music would come up, and if you were on the set, the hair would rise at mm -hmm. the back of your neck. You knew you could not make a mistake. You had to do it right. You had to know everything. You had to do everything. The pressure was huge, but it was so exciting. And you were working with the best of the best. I mean, I was on the first days of Wine and Roses with Piper Laurie and Cliff Robertson. Right. Just changing her clothes, you know, behind the Green. <laughs> the fact <laughs> it was that it was ah dynamite. It was wonderful, yeah. and I knew John Frankenheimer, and I worked yeah. with him quite a few times. He was great. Yeah, I've got. He went on to become a huge director, the Manchurian Candidate, the great movie. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, wow, got yeah, Cliff Robertson and Piper Laurie on Days of Wine and Roses. That that must have been just, you know, amazing to work with those it two. Was. I can remember the feeling of being on that set at that time to this day. The acting was so great. Everything was so it was such an emotional Playhouse 90, and I did a lot of Playhouse 90, so I, I don't, I think five or so, and, you know, I did other live TV, but this one really stands out in my mind, because it was, it was so terrific uh, a performance. 
Yeah, yeah, they were great. Yeah, I think PBS still airs, you know, the occasional live theater, but not quite like, you know, the the major networks did back in the 50s and 60s. It was great. I mean, Marty on Playhouse 90, oh my gosh. I think it was on Playhouse 90, well, wherever it was. I, it was, I mean, we had some wonderful, wonderful theater on television. It was a great time. It was. Do you remember working with Nick Adams on The Rebel? I do. I do. Uh, he seems very friendly and nice, and that's about all I remember. Yeah, he was a great actor. I'm sure uh, to this day you have a lot of fans from 101 Dalmatians. I do. I'd be mean, bad to show up at my door. It was quite scary, but they were women, so it was a little not so scary, but still, I was surprised. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how did that come about for you? Oh, uh, getting the part in 101 Dalmatians? Yeah. Oh, um, I probably just went on an interview, and they listened to your voice, and asked you to do a British accent, and I got a part, and so there were five of us. Um, one of the people didn't make it to the final, um, but there were then four, and we'd uh, go, uh, we'd start out going to school in the morning, and then they'd call us out one at a time, and we'd, um, they had uh, all of the cartooning, story, the storyboards along the floor of the puppies and what the puppies looked like and mm -hmm. what they were supposed to be. And then we'd go into uh, a booth and we would do all of the voices mm -hmm. for all of the puppies for that segment. And then they'd call us back a few months later. They'd done more art. And, you know, we came back and, and did, you know, more. And uh, we never worked with anyone else. We never saw Walt Disney. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we never did it, you know, it was like that was it. And uh, I didn't even know I was Lucky Puppy until, oh, I don't know, about 10 years ago. So that, you know, I never knew who I was. Yeah. And that was a surprise to me. It's like, oh, okay, good. Oh, yippee. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, it was fun being on it. Um, and uh, that was that. And I did go back to Disney for a release oh, probably seven years ago. Uh -huh. uh, they didn't have anything uh, for the latest release because it was COVID. But I had a great time, and um, it was wonderful. And uh, Howard Green, who works uh, with the animation department and does all the uh, advertising and writing, he is just a wonderful man, and and he worked very hard to to get to make everything a success, and it was. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember if you recorded in the same booth as David Frankham? I, I don't. Yeah, I interviewed him a couple of years ago. He's 96 years old, and he's still going to conventions and signings and doing interviews. You know, he's still going, that man. <laughs> Who is he? He's a, he, he was in um, a lot of Vincent Price movies, uh, the, a lot of the horror Vincent Price movies and stuff, and he was on... Um, <laughs> He um let me look up his character's name here. Who was he the voice of? He was He was uh oh. Sergeant Tibbs. Oh, okay. Well, that was a, a fun cat. Yeah. Yeah. I think he was in uh, uh some little shorts that they made. Um, yeah, cute voice, yeah, it's funny. How, how was making the children's hour? Well, um, 
William Wyler was a great. He made movies that were the best movies. I mean, honestly, friendly persuasion. You mm. can't get better than that. And he was um, in his older years, and he was a very nice kind man. Uh, but I think his Children's Hour, the first one, was the better of the two. Because he, this was a recreation of the first one that was uh, made with Miriam Hopkins as one of the leads. And then in the second one, she played the aunt. And, um, Shirley McLean didn't like kids and didn't ever talk to us <laughs> and <laughs> ignored us and told jokes with the grip. And oh, yeah, didn't she swear a lot? I, I, well, she barely talked to us, so I, I wouldn't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I really don't remember her ever saying anything to Shirley Did I say Shirley McLean? Yeah, uh, Shirley I, McLean. I yeah, anyway, uh, but Audrey Hepburn was a princess. She yeah. would, uh, when they were setting up the lights, she do pirouettes across the stage. She was, she was just absolutely ethereal. She was sweet and kind and lovely and all the good things. All good things that you would like movie stars she was. And she get dropped off by a chauffeur driven limousine mm-hmm. and and wave hello at us. <laughs> and then she'd get picked up by the chauffeur driven limousine and then she'd wave goodbye to all of us. She was, she was just adorable. She was wonderful. She was what, wonderful. What, about, what about James Gardner? Oh, he's always great. You know, he's just a good guy. He's good guy. He always was a good guy and continued to be a good guy. He just was. Yeah, he was great. I was. Yeah. I, I remember when you were on Leave It to Beaver. Oh yeah, the stalking one. That was a good one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was before the, the word was probably invented. <laughs> I know. I know. Really. I, and that was the fun part because, you know, it, you like anything that's a little bit brutally or different or something. And uh, so, yeah, I like that. It was great. And my three sons? <laughs> yeah, I liked going to, to school with the, all the boys, and that was fun. And, yeah, my three sons was great. That was, yeah. Yeah, did you work with Tina Cole? I don't know. I don't. I guess. I maybe. I don't know. I've, I've interviewed her. She's a great lady. So, what made Have you? you interviewed Beverly Washburn. Oh, I love Beverly Washburn. Me too. <laughs> oh my God! I just I adore her. I mean, she. Me she is. She is the mold that God broke. I mean, she is just. She's so she's so honest and real, but so sweet and down to earth. Yep. yep. She's just a doll, isn't she? Yes, I, I I can't say enough about her. I just I truly adore her, and she loved the Christmas card I sent her this past year. Oh, good. That's good. Well, uh, we had not spoken until oh, a couple weeks ago, nice. and we just connected after fifty some years. And it's like, and we always like each other. We can't even remember what we worked together on. Uh-huh. Uh, but we've known each other. We knew each other as kids. She was a little older, so she would always be in the older group. But she was always nice. She was always sweet. She was always funny. Mm-hmm. And she's still the same girl. She's still the same. Yes. So what made you want to leave acting after a while? I think acting left me. I just wasn't <laughs> getting a lot of work, and they kept saying to me, well, we need new faces. We've used you enough. That's really, thank you. That's very nice of you. I had never wanted to be an actress. Nobody asked 
me if I wanted to do this. And so I just left and went out and had a life and ended up having a goat farm in Los Gatos. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was, you know, for 25 plus years, I was up in the mountains and in the redwoods with my goats and all my animals and my chickens and everything, and that's what I'd always wanted, and it was great. Yeah. So, so tell me about a minor consideration. Oh, I would love to tell you about a minor consideration. So, um, I was in Los Gatos. Mm -hmm. I didn't watch TV during the day, and for some reason, you know how there is just serendipity. Uh, I turned on television, and it was a talk show, and there was Paul. And I hadn't talked to Paul in decades. I hadn't mm -hmm. talked in. I left the business, and I left the business. And so I saw Paul, and he was talking about a minor consideration. And I thought, wow, how wonderful. What? I just couldn't believe it. And that he had created it and was, you know, working to help all these people that had problems. And so I called him and he said, where have you been? And I said, having a life. And he said, Ew, okay. He said, hey, we're going back into the union. We're going to try to change the Coogan law. Now that affected me directly. Paul had been on a series, so he was under contract. And the Coogan Law states that the money is saved for kids under contract. Mm -hmm. That was the big problem with the Coogan Law. Because in the 50s, most everybody was freelance. They weren't under contract. Right. So um, most of us didn't get our money saved. And my money was used to support the family. And that was that. And if you ask me whether I was mad about it or not, I, I sure was. So, um, anyway, uh, Paul said, you know, we're going back. And I said, I'm there. I'll be there with you. And uh, I went down there, and we, uh, we did all kinds of great things to help kid actors. I am... So proud of the work that we did, and it's all thanks to Paul. He gets the credit for everything. If it wasn't for him, none of this would have happened. So I came down from Los Gatos almost every month, mm -hmm. and it took us almost eight years. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> And I think about that now, and I think, and one day I said to somebody, and this was after we'd gotten the, the law passed, and we got to speak to, you know, our state legislature. It was very exciting. And nobody impresses me, you know, because I worked with famous people my whole life. But where people, meeting people that change our laws and our lives, that's pretty important. So I was really happy. I brought my husband. I was so happy to speak to them. Anyway, uh, it we finally got tired at about 10 years. Mm. But for kid actors, there were only a handful of us. There was Jenny Russell. There was um, Johnny Whitaker. Right. And Paul and me. And if I forgot anybody, oh, God, I'm sorry. And there were moms that were on the committee, and there was my great friend Liz Graham, who she's an actress and an <coughs> author, and uh, she had a, a son who was in the business. Mm -hmm. And so we all worked tirelessly. I'm not kidding. We worked. And people were saying, oh, who cares about kid actors? They're all brats. <laughs> These are children. These are children that need to be protected. So anyway, so because of Paul and because of a minor consideration that was helping kids who had a tough time with transitioning, 
into just normal life, which Paul set up, and it was very helpful to a lot of people. Yeah. I'm sure a lot of people will say that they're still alive because of him. And, um, and then to go on and do this good work at Screen Actors Guild, it, it was, this was, I'm the proudest of my whole life for this work we did. We did day one, dollar one, 15%. And if you think, oh, that's not enough money, Kids have a lot of expenses, and (laughs) kids have agents, sometimes they have, and that's 10%, managers, that's 15%, they're getting taxed at a high rate, they need clothes, they need lessons, they need headshots, it goes on and on. So you see how it's expensive, it's expensive to be a kid actor, and um, so anyway, it it was, we had orientations, we'd have stars come in that were famous, and they'd come and talk to the kids every month. It was, it was great. And we left, and now everything's on computers. It's just, we were just tired, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, look at, you know, Jackie Coogan and Macaulay Culkin. I mean, there are, there are cases where, you know, public, you would think that, you know, the, the, the laws and everything would have, would have changed uh, when, when, those, when those cases happened. I mean, you know, Jackie Coogan, I mean, he did have Coogan's Law, you know, eventually. Oh, yeah, but it was after all his money was gone. Yeah. And his parents have used it to support the rest of his life. Yeah. <laughs> and he was in the audience at the Academy Awards when Charlie Chaplin got his honorary Oscar. Yes, and that was special, very special. Yeah, yeah that, that kind of loyalty is so rare in Hollywood nowadays. It is, it really is. So how, 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 how well is uh, your book doing? It's doing very fine, thank you very much. It's, it's, uh, uh, my book is a little different than everybody's book. It, it talks about my career, mm-hmm. and, it, you know, it has photos and all the things that I was in, but it also talks a lot about what it's like to be a kid actor. And and just, you know, things like costuming. Yeah. You don't think about that, but, but what costuming was like in the olden days and and it also talks about the rules and regulations and what parents should know and it talks about how it affects families right and these are all really important things that people don't really think about and there's many many uh different aspects of the business that are sometimes a surprise to people. Mm-hmm. And and it's told to people that, oh, this is going to be fun for your child. Your child will just go there and have a really good time. That's not true. Your child is going there to work as an actor. And they have to act as the adults act. They can't goof off. They have to know their lines. They have to be on time, and they have to know their mark. And that is what they're doing. They're not there to have fun. And I think it's important that they know that. And if kids want to work, great. I mean, we want kids in the business. Mm. We want to see kids in, in shows. It's fun to see. I mean, you see some kid, kid you fall in love with that kid. The kid is clever and cute. Oh, <laughs> that's my dog. <laughs> uh, one of my dogs. Anyway, uh, you know, we want kids in the business, but we 
But everybody needs information. Right. You know, information is power. And then you go from an informed way of looking at the business, and then you, you handle it with all the information, and I think that's important. I'm, I'm definitely going to get a copy of the book. I want to I read it. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, April 15th and 16th, you'll be at the Hollywood Show in Burbank. Have you appeared there before? I have not. This is going to be your first... All this is new to me. Oh, this is going to be your first signing experience. Well, it, let me just wait. I, I'm a liar. That's not true. Okay. <laughs> um, in the early 90s, Charlie was not doing well financially. Okay. And uh, Paul and I got together, and we did a thing at Beverly Garland Hotel. Mm -hmm. uh, that was an autograph show. So I did... Um, two shows because we wanted to, we gave our money to Charlie to help Charlie. And, um, so I did that, but that was, that's the only thing I did. Yeah. I, I was going to go to my first Hollywood show in 2020 and then the pandemic happened, unfortunately. Um, uh, I wish I could attend this one, but someday I will, you know, and, ho and hopefully you'll go back again, you know, if you like this experience. Well, we'll see. You know, I, I'll i give almost anything a try. And let me tell you, I haven't, I, I have friends in the business, but I'm, you know, I'm definitely not a working actor. And, and I say some things in my book that I'll never get hired. <laughs> 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 but, um, but this has been a charmed, thing for me. Uh, Flip Mark, who was a friend of mine when I was a kid, mm -hmm. he got in touch with me. And we've seen each other. He lives in Phoenix. And I went there. I, my cousin lives in Phoenix also. And so I went to visit my cousin and I visited Flip. And I tell you, it was just charmed. I, we were so happy to see each other. We hadn't seen each other you know, in ever. And and then talking to Beverly, and uh, I talked to my old girlfriend, Cheryl, Cheryl Calloway. She was um, in uh, a bunch of movies, mm -hmm. and she was my childhood girlfriend because we had things in common. I didn't have anything in common with, you know, regular kids at school. Right. And uh, so this has been a charmed time for me. It's been happy. Uh, I... I didn't think about it, and I am so delighted, delighted with it. It's, it's wonderful. Oh, that is wonderful. So I have a, I have a joke for you. Okay. What did the elephant say to the naked man? Oh. Where's your trunk? I don't know. <laughs> Close. Man, how can you breathe through that thing? <laughs> oh, boy, we're both, we have we have our heads in the same place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's a great joke. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I, when, I, when I sent Beverly the Christmas card, I, I put a, a joke in there and she liked it. Oh, good. Okay. I'll have to ask her what it was. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Mimi, I thank you so much for coming on today, and you were just so delightful. Uh, we, we managed not to swear during this hour. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we good? We're just good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like I said, I hope you have a great time uh, signing at the Hollywood show, and, um, and, and um, I hope uh, everything is uh, safe over where you're at. Thank you, and I hope everything is safe where you are. We're fine out over here. Uh, nothing is uh, untoward. Yeah, thank you, Tommy. I appreciate you calling me and interviewing me, and uh, thank you so much. And it was wonderful. It was a wonderful interview. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, and it was my pleasure. And have yourself a great day, and once again, stay safe. Okay, thanks. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye.
Well, there you have it. Mimi Gibson, ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, what a wonderful, kind lady, huh? And that's great that she's friends with Beverly. I had no idea, but then again, it was such a small world back then. All the child actors knew each other. She's doing great for child actors' rights. And take a look at her book, Working Kid. I will certainly get a copy myself. And check her out at the Hollywood Show, April 15th and the 16th in Burbank. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying... There's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.